complications of getting transfusions? What's the big deal? Why don't we just transfuse people frequently? So, so obviously there are like short-term complications. We just talked about you know the logistics and the social factors and the economic factors that we always forget also about transfusions and the burden on the system. Uh, for patients, obviously, there are still infusion reactions. Every now and then we have patients that will have reaction to transfusions. Uh, fluid overload or volume overload, which is Again, not uncommon because, as we mentioned, most of those patients are under in, in their 70s. Uh, with platelets particularly, alloimmunization is an issue. Half of the patients after a while will become alloimmunized, not respond to platelet transfusions. Less with red blood cell transfusion, but it becomes more challenging to, to match the blood for those patients. Uh, in, in MDS, obviously, the recurrent blood transfusions on the long term, iron overload is one of the major things that we, we worry about. Uh, once patients are up to 15 or 20 units of blood transfusion, they have evidence or enough level of iron to cause iron overload with the known long-term complications. Uh, so I think we can think of the complications in short-term and long-term as well. Great, nicely, nicely stated. Um, and is there a way to minimize those complications? On, on the short term, obviously, like sometimes free medication will decrease some of the infusion reactions. Uh, sometimes using diuretics to decrease fluid overload, like the usual tricks that we use. Uh, on on the longer term, I think obviously iron chelation, which is a very important topic, and of, there's always debate about do you chelate or not, and in which pa patients. Uh, so I, I think on the short term, again, the usual medical practices to, comp to decrease those. In platelets, maybe trying to restrict the transfusion sometimes when they are really needed to avoid that alloimmunization. And then the iron overload and when do you introduce or use iron chelation therapy. Do you use iron chelation therapy? I think about iron chelation therapy and everybody who is transfusion dependent. I mean, ideally you'd like them to get, come off transfusion with the treatments that you're offering, but if you are not successful and your patient is requiring frequent transfusions, then yes. Question is, at what threshold do you start to chelate? And I think that's like hotly debated, right? So there's a couple of guidelines, uh, any ferritin over a thousand by the MDS Foundation or uh, the NCCN guidelines tell you a ferritin of 2,500. I frankly think that it has to do with the um, frequency of transfusion dependency. If your patient is requiring frequent blood transfusions, well, perhaps if you started at 2,500, you're never going to get down to where you need to be. So it's totally patient dependent. But yes, I think it's important to consider it. The next question becomes, are they able to tolerate the iron chelator I'm about to prescribe in terms of their kidney um, uh, function in terms of their liver function test, in terms of their auditory ocular, which is, are all the things that you need to worry about with the uh, chelation. So those are all things that go into my mind. But I, I'm a believer. I believe that chelating the iron, reducing the d damage that may come from the non-transferring bound iron or labile uh, plasma iron, those are the two fractions that are chelatable, by the way. I think it will be... Um, probably associated with the reduction in uh, risk for um, cardiac events. And it's been shown in the Telesto study, and even though it wasn't um, powered enough for detect and proven in survival, I think it was sufficient for me to say, okay, that's something we really need to do. The problem is being able to get an older patient to tolerate the appropriate dose of chelation, which I find to be a real challenge. I have very few patients that can actually take the adequate dose of, of a chelator to be able to be effective. And that has to do with just tolerance of the medication, uh, you know, what happens to their creatinine clearance, um, and, you know, complications that they may have. And these are older patients that are already on a whole lot of medicines for a whole lot of other things. And you're adding a medicine that may sort of tip the balance with, with uh, their ability to deal with the side effects of them all. So I find ideally you want to chelate the patients who are, are receiving frequent transfusions, and particularly those that you're hoping to get to transplant you know, at some point in time. But it can be very hard to get your patient to tolerate an adequate dose. Yeah, I think it's important to emphasize first the population of MDS patients that will benefit probably from iron chelation are the lower risk patients. I often see that brought as an issue in the higher risk. I think in the higher risk, you know, the disease tempo and the treatment takes over. So the lower risk patients are a group to consider. 
I think when you put all the evidence together, there are several retrospective, prospective observational studies, one randomized clinical trial that suggested benefit for patients. As, as mentioned, the Telasto showed you know, decreased hospitalization for patients, decreased heart failure, trend for overall survival, but not significant, obviously. So uh, in, in lower risk patients, I do consider iron chelation. I discuss it. I do individualize it because of the toxicity profile. Half of those patients may not be able to stay on this treatment for a year or, or more. My approach to it is also like if I'm introducing treatment for the disease, I don't introduce the iron chelation at the same time because then if we had side effects, I'm not going to be able to know which caused what. So either if patients had no other options and they are now just transfusion dependent, then I bring it. And sometimes if I had patients that I started my treatment and had a response and they still have evidence of, you know, iron overload from prior transfusions, I take that window of response to a treatment to do chelation because it becomes more effective. They are not getting more blood transfusions. So I do discuss it uh, individualized. You know, I don't have a magical number of the ferritin. It has to be lower risk patients, uh, and that's my approach. So hearing slightly different opinions on iron chelation therapy, I actually don't chelate patients, so I'm more on the chelation nihilist side of things. Um, because I uh, keep waiting for um, some prospective study to show uh, clinically meaningful advantage to patients. The Telesto study, which was a good effort towards this goal, um, unfortunately was in accruing so slowly they had to ratchet down the number of patients who were eventually enroll enrolled, which left it terribly underpowered. And while it was quote unquote blinded, in reality, um, ferritin levels were followed. Right, so, and you can, for, for all the stones I throw at chelation therapy, it does lower iron levels. That's, it's, a, it, it's a real phenomenon. So that lack of true blinding, I think, impacted the number of patients who were admitted to hospitals and those who may have had certain comorbidities actually uh, recorded. I think I'm a nihilist if we're ever gonna know the answer. Because on that study when you know, we tried to accrue patients, it was literally impossible. Um, so and, I'm, you and know, why I, was it? Why was it impossible? Uh, I think that one of the problems was that patients that were sent to us for referral had already been placed on chelation by their outpatient community doctor in some, in some cases. Patients just were not um, excited about going on a trial for iron chelation. It was a hard sell for patients on this randomized trial. Um, so randomized trials can be very difficult for some patients because they're interested if they're on the treatment arm, but they're in not interested at all if there's a non-treatment arm. And so it can be difficult to get patients to commit. So after, trying to, after working to try and get patients on the study, I don't know if we're ever going to have a study that will be powered to answer the question about iron chelation, which means that we're all kind of left to our own devices and opinions as to you know, whether or not that's the, it's the best thing to do. And um, you know, it's a question waiting to be answered. I would love to see the trial that would answer it, but I'm, I'm skeptical that we're ever gonna get that. So I, I think we can all agree, um, and I'm sure you've all had patients as I have who come to me and all they wanna talk about is their iron levels, um, probably as a result of a lot of direct-to-consumer marketing. Right. And they'd rather talk about their iron levels than they would about treating their MDS. So I, I think though we can all agree that the priority should be treating the MDS um, and then vote with your conscience on, on whether or not to uh, reduce the uh, iron levels.